today. They've been translating the Bible for 75 years. God has it all planned out. Now they're bringing the gospel to one of the largest unreached groups in the world. This creates a lot of context. Plus, this is truly our Christmas story. And it's one that played out across many years. I knew that God had heard my prayer. A mom-to-be holds on to a decades-old promise. I cannot and will not leave this sanctuary until I hear from you. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. It's getting closer and closer to the big day, but of course it's been the big day since Halloween. <laughs> but we, we've rushed Christmas, but it's coming. And now the big Christmas present that the Congress and the President gave us, big business bonuses, sign-up bonuses for employees, billions of dollars invested back into America. That's how companies like AT&T and Boeing are responding to President Trump's amazing tax cut and victory. And millions of American workers will start to see more take-home pay early next year. It's all just a presidential signature away now that both houses of Congress passed tax reform. And as Abigail Robertson shows us, celebrations are already underway. Republican lawmakers' spirits are high after they successfully handed President Trump his biggest legislative victory to date, overhauling the tax code. Hasn't been done in 34 years, but actually really hasn't been done because we broke every record. It's the largest, I always say the most massive, but it's the largest tax cut in the history of our country and reform, but tax cut. After Wednesday's House approval, GOP lawmakers loaded into buses and headed to the White House for a tax reform victory party. This is the kind of relief that Americans deserve. This is the kind of tax reform and tax cuts that get our economy growing to reach its potential. Republicans like Congressman Robert Pittenger believe this bill will lead to historic economic growth. I think it'll be transformational, much as it was in 1986 with the Reagan tax cuts. We saw enormous growth in jobs and as well as an increase in wages. Many in the corporate world agree, like AT&T and Boeing, offering employee bonuses to celebrate the corporate tax rate falling from 35 to 21 percent. But Democrats argue only the rich will benefit, a claim with which Pittenger strongly disagrees. The naysayers are always there. They were there with the Reagan cuts. At the time of the Reagan tax cuts, only 18 percent of the people believe they're getting a tax cut. Uh, most of the rest of them believe they're getting a tax increase. That's the kind of misinformation that's out there in the marketplace. Republicans believe Americans will see the benefits starting in February. An average family who makes $70,000 a year, they're going to get about a $2,000 uh, tax cut out of this directly back in their pocket. The bill still needs President Trump's signature, and that might not happen until January. That's because any newly signed law that increases the deficit requires automatic spending cuts. Republicans hope to waive that rule before the end of the year. If not, Trump would sign it in 2018, which would give the GOP another year to figure out how to avoid the automatic cuts. Lawmakers also face a potential government shutdown if they don't quickly move to fund the government into next year. Republicans hope to reach a spending compromise by Friday or their tax reform victory will be short-lived. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, if you want to see if you're getting a tax cut, uh, head to CBNNews.com and check out a list of tax calculations. In other news, there's a word of a possible terror attack in Melbourne, Australia. Our John Jessup has more. That is right, Pat. 19 people were injured when a driver plowed his vehicle directly into pedestrians in a busy commercial district. Gary Lane has more on this developing story. It was 4.30 p.m. Thursday, Melbourne time. People were in the city's central shopping district doing some Christmas shopping. Suddenly, a white SUV seemed to come out of nowhere, plowing into pedestrians at a busy intersection. Some of the victims were seriously injured. 
Local media reported 13 victims were taken to hospitals, including a preschool-aged child with serious head injuries. Police are being cautious about whether it was an act of terror. At this stage, we believe it is a deliberate act. Can I repeat that? At this stage, we believe it is a deliberate act. However, we do not know the motivation and it is still early stages of the investigation. Police say the driver is an Australian citizen of Afghan descent who has a known history of drug use and mental health issues. When the vehicle stopped, a crowd of people gathered around the driver, pulled him from the vehicle and held him until police arrived. Later, authorities took a second man into custody. Oh, it's bloody horrific. Surpri like shocking and surprising that it's happened again. So. I'm speechless. Back in January, a driver intentionally killed four people in Melbourne, not far from this latest attack. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. Well, President Trump issued a challenge for the United Nations ahead of the U.N. General Assembly vote against his decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. At his final cabinet meeting of the year, Mr. Trump delivered a word of warning to the U.N. and to countries that receive American aid. They take hundreds of millions of dollars and even billions of dollars and then they vote against us. Well, we're watching those votes. Let them vote against us. We'll save a lot. We don't care. The United States sends the United Nations $8 billion a year, which is about 22 percent of the U.N. budget. Trump says the money America sends is mismanaged by a bloated bureaucracy that often votes against Israel and American interests. Meanwhile, faith was also on display at that cabinet meeting. The president asked Health and Human Services Secretary Ben Carson to lead a prayer for the cabinet. In this time of discord, distrust, and dishonesty, we ask that you would give us a spirit of gratitude, compassion, and common sense, and give us the wisdom to be able to guide this great nation in the future, we ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, the 2016 presidential election proved to be one of the biggest political upsets in American history. Now, a couple of members of Donald Trump's inner circle are pulling back the curtain in the book, Let Trump Be Trump. CBN's Jenna Browder met with former campaign manager Corin Lewandowski and brings us this story. It's a rip-roaring tale from the campaign trail. You know, it's one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had. As told by former Trump campaign manager Corey Lewandowski and former deputy campaign manager David Bossie. And I equate my time with him as a jockey on a famous racehorse. You just have to let him run, and you put the blinders on him, you try and guide him into the course a little bit. But a man like Donald Trump, I didn't want to change, and he didn't want to be changed. So let Trump be Trump is the inside story of the rise of him as a candidate and then right through the presidency. The book is loaded with insider stories. One of the most interesting involving Paul Manafort, who they say did try to change the candidate. We were coming back from Delaware and we were taking the helicopter back and this was right at the time in the campaign where Paul was trying to exert, exert more influence on what he was going to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And he had gone to Florida and he spoke to the Republican National Committee members and to paraphrase he said, I'm going to change Donald Trump. You're going to see a different Donald Trump moving forward. He's not going to be the freewheeling candidate that he was in the primary. He's going to be something different. When Trump got wind of the plan, he had the pilot lower the helicopter so he could make a phone call. And he just annihilated Paul because he said, I don't want to change. I've been the same person I have been for 70 years. Don't try and change me. Lewandowski also found out what it was like to be on the receiving end of Trump's temper. Well, it's tough. It's tough. And I'll tell you, uh, Mr. Trump, candidate Trump, but now President Trump is a perfectionist and he expects, demands and deserves people to work as hard as he does. President Trump, he has tremendous support with evangelicals. I'm wondering, you know, when you were on the campaign trail, were there any conversations between the two of you about um, how you would court this block of voters? When you think about Iowa, a state that has a large evangelical population, when we started the campaign, all the pundits told us, don't try and win Iowa because those evangelicals will never support you, Mr. Trump. And who came out early for us? People like Jerry Falwell Jr. of Liberty University, the great Paula White, the Reverend Paula White. So many other pastors came and said, you want to judge a man and his faith? Look at his children. Lewandowski told me how faith played a big part in the campaign, especially when a potential bombshell dropped. Whether it was uh, the Access Hollywood tape, right? That was a, the Billy Bush tape. We talked about it a lot in the book and the impact that that had and those women who came forward who accused him of things. 
You had to look into your faith for that. And I called Jerry Falwell Jr. And I read about it in the book, Jerry, I've got to go on TV in five minutes. What do I do? And he said, Corey, my father, Jerry Falwell Sr., would always say, we're not voting for a Sunday school teacher. We're voting for the leader of the free world. And no man is perfect, but we have to look at it in the totality. The whole campaign experience is one Lewandowski says he never would have dreamed of being a part of growing up. And it was, uh, look, I'm a guy from Lowell, Massachusetts, who, um, you know, never had privilege, never had any money, I never went to the best schools. But I developed a work ethic in that blue-collar town that helped me be successful of guiding an incredible candidate amongst the most amazing journey. And I had a front row seat of history, and now I get to call a president of the United States a friend. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Some interesting insights into that historic campaign. Pat, back to you. Unbelievable. And it's amazing that uh, Corey has stayed loyal to the president. The president uh, is still a friend. Uh, he puts a lot of stake in loyalty, and he also likes smarts. He, he wants people who are competent. But this guy, if he keeps going, is going to go into history as one of the great presidents of the United States. He is a transformational president. And ladies and gentlemen, like it or not, the United States was going down a slippery slope into oblivion. We had, we had a group in charge of this country that literally acted like they hated free enterprise and they hated America. And what was being done was nothing short of appalling. And the president has reversed that. And of course, uh, he's dealing with a, uh, a hidden group in his own uh, uh, administration who are doing everything they can to uh, unseat him. And he's got to clean house on those things. That so-called deep state has got to go. He has to get some loyalists in there. and. I think uh, it's one of those things he doesn't want to do it because it'll cost a lot of money and so forth. But on the strength of the huge win in this tax uh, uh, bill, I think he needs to get some people in place in the Justice Department and other places who are loyal to him and who at least uh, embrace his agenda. And if he doesn't, he's going to get a lot of people who are continuously hammering at him. And he doesn't deserve it because he is doing a, just a fabulous job. Do you think I, it's clear to him who the people are that oh, yeah, need to go? They, they know it. But, you know, uh, his, his attorney general, is the idea that the attorney general will recuse himself of all these things, and he has, you know, he's accused he recused of one thing, but he, he doesn't have to recuse himself of acting uh, as the chief legal officer of the president of the United States. And uh, they've got to clean house with the FBI. It's just appalling what, what's been, uh, and those people are still in power. They, they need to get fired. I mean, the, those, those people who wrote those emails that, you know, we, we've got to stop him and how are we going to do it? And they, here, here are our plans. Uh, and this is, we're going to Andy's office and Andy is still like this number two man in the, in the FBI. They've got, to, they've got to get those guys out of there. I mean, it's just going to mean, I, I don't think the American people will object if he, if he does what he needs to do, but the person who needs to do it is the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm afraid Jeff Sessions is letting him down. So we hope for the best, but uh, anyhow, he's, he's riding high, and all I can do is salute Mr. President, you're doing a great job. All right. Well, up next, there are 70 million, 70 million deaf people worldwide, and less than 2% of them have a Bible in a language they can understand. Why not give them scripture in their heart language? Why not translate the scriptures in a format that they can understand and offer videoed content that they can have on technological devices? See how Wycliffe translators are now reaching deaf people around the world with the Word of God. You know, in the early days of CBN, we had a uh, minister to the deaf. And uh, his name was John Stallings. He had been raised by deaf parents. So he was fluent in sign language. And so he could preach 
on the air and also sign. Wow. So we were on the air one day, and a mouse got into the audio section of our <laughs> transmitter and blew out the audio. So we didn't have any audio in our primitive... Uh, but the deaf so, audience <laughs> continued. Well, that's right. So we had to continue in the, in the sign language. So there was sound for the deaf, and there was pictures for everybody else. <laughs> so, that's wonderful. Yeah, it, was, it was kind of cute. But uh, anyhow, uh, you at Orphan's Promise are doing something right now for deaf people. Well, we have a number of projects with deaf children, especially in Vietnam. We work with a great organization there. And, you know, just you don't realize how isolating it is just learning how to sign our name and their name. They just flew out of their chairs and ran to us to communicate and yeah. to, just to get a hug because they knew we were interested in finding out well, more. All, about all these they children were deaf. They're all, all deaf. Of them deaf. Yeah. My. Well, across the globe, there are around 2,000 languages which have no translation of the Bible. Now it's fifth year. The world-renowned Wycliffe Bible translators continues this work in reducing that number. And one of their newest projects is reaching the deaf people. Mark Martin has that. For 75 years, Wycliffe Bible translators have put God's Word into various languages around the world. The scriptures clearly state that the Word will go forth to all people, all nations around the world, and then Christ will return. And God has it all planned out. And the fact that he chooses to use an organization like Wycliffe to help bring about his plan just encourages me. While the numbers are also encouraging, much work still needs to be done. The organization says up to 160 million people need the Bible translated in their languages. But when God's Word becomes alive in the language that you use at home with your family, and then you see that God speaks your language, you realize this is not someone else's message. This is a message intended for me. And it becomes foundational to all other things that the church does. One new frontier is the deaf community, and Wycliffe's working with Deaf Bible Society to reach this often overlooked group. We believe that they are a part of the Great Commission's command, and they too do have a right to know God's truth. The need is great. Deaf Bible Society estimates there are 70 million deaf people worldwide, and less than 2% have interacted with the Bible in a language that they can understand. It doesn't stop there. Of the more than 350 sign languages, Pagan tells CBN News not one has a complete Bible translation, even American Sign Language or ASL. Some may wonder, why doesn't the deaf community just read a printed Bible? What many people don't realize is as hearing individuals, we um, grow and are raised in the environment and context of the noisy world. Um, we have sound all around us. That for us is developing language. It's developing what we use to learn to read and to write later in life. For a deaf person, they don't have that experience. Pagan calls sign language the heart language of the deaf. It's how they communicate best. It's how they understand best. And I think that the Lord wants to communicate with us best. He wants to, us to understand Him and he wants that for the deaf community as well. So why not give them scripture in their heart language? Why not translate the scriptures in a format that they can understand and offer videoed content that they can have on technological um, devices? Director of Operations Aidan Burke talked with us about the importance of this translation effort through interpreter Misty Sir. And when I was growing up, I saw so many different uh, churches where I'd see people signing directly from the Bible in English. And often there are misconcepts that are you know, misconstrued as to what the actual meaning is. And so I always struggled with that growing up. Burke is encouraged by recent progress specifically for ASL. Once a translation is complete, the scripture engagement department steps in. Then they focus on um, knowing how to use that translation. How do we apply it? How do we teach it to the community? Um, it could be different ways of applying what they have. It could be on the app, on, the, on their phone. We caught up with Brandon, who demonstrated the Deaf Bible app. So you can see there's two different sections here. One is called ASLV, and it's book by book of the Bible. And the other one is CBT, and that's more of um, Bible stories 
that are in a story format for deaf people to watch. Computer technology is essential to the process. Uh, so Sean Collins oversees the software program known as Chameleon. Uh, we're using motion capture, so we're actually capturing the signer, we're tracking their motions, and we're putting it into a 3D avatar in a 3D environment. So this allows us to change the avatar to look like a local national or a biblical character in a historical environment. And in a visual language like sign language, this creates a lot of context. All this helps Wycliffe reach deaf people around the world with the Word of God. We watched field coordinator Severa Trevino make contact with a deaf translation team from Tanzania for the first time. I'm so excited. He told me he couldn't be in contact because they were having internet issues and we'd have to wait until next year. But now here we are. The Holy Spirit ordered that, that right as we were walking by, that mm -hmm. connection happened. <laughs> oh, I yeah. feel goosebumps, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Deaf Bible Society says so far, 30 sign languages have portions of the Bible translated. The organization and Wycliffe hope in the next three years that 100 more will be added to that list. Stuart Thiessen says mm. deaf people are usually the last people to learn what's happening in the world. Even with the Bible, we're still the last people to know. I'm very excited that we have the ability um, for deaf people to get the support they need now that we're making all these translations happening. Taking God's word to people from all walks of life and helping to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. In Arlington, Texas, Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Great story. Those people are really tremendous. Wy Wycliffe is a fabulous organization, does extremely good work. But this to the deaf is just a small part of what they do. They've been translating the Bible into thousands of languages around the world. They are a wonderful organization. Really I are. think this is so exciting. There's something very beautiful about sign language to me. It's like dancing with your hands, you know? <laughs> I guess. I mean, but it. it it takes a lot to learn all that stuff. Yes, and, and carry on these kinds of conversations. I was mentioning to Terry during the break, they had a news report. They were, they were having a tragedy in some city in Florida, and they were desperate for a sign person, so they, they just grabbed this man or woman, I think, the one of each. And uh, they began signing, and they were just putting up gibberish. They, they weren't, yeah. what they were doing had no meaning at all, but they were doing, going through these motions like they'd they do. They pulled it off with They pulled it off, <laughs> but they were, they were just both frauds. <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was in the, the national news, because, you know, but hopefully that's not what Wycliffe is doing. All right. No, Wycliffe is not. Well, coming up, a wife is desperate to become a mother. God told me I'd have a son one day, and he gave me the name Simeon. When I looked up Simeon in the Bible, it meant that God had heard, so I knew that God had heard my prayer. Watch this woman and her husband receive a Christmas miracle when we come back. Merry Christmas! That's our Ukrainian staff in Kiev, and Merry Christmas to all of you from all of them. We're showing uh, Nigeria, and we're showing the Philippines, and That's we're showing right. the Ukraine. We've got people all over the world. That's we really we nice. We do indeed, and they're what celebrating nice as well. Sorry. Well, Celeste Marshall had a dream of telling her husband Terry that she was pregnant on Christmas Day, which was also his birthday. Five years ago, Celeste's dream came true after 10 long years of waiting on a promise from God. People would ask the question, when are you guys going to have kids? And it would just be almost like a dagger. They have no idea of the burning desire that you truly have to be a mom. When Celeste and Terry Marshall married in 2001, they were eager to start a family. But after a year and a half, they still weren't pregnant. Celeste saw a fertility specialist, where she learned she had polyps, fibroids, and endometriosis on her uterus and needed surgery. Her surgeon, Dr. Michael Randell, said she could expect good news. Not being able to get pregnant can be due to myriad factors. Whenever you have surgery, right after surgery, your chances are significantly improved. 
Celeste believed her best chances were through prayer. We were at a church service and there was a visiting evangelist that was at our church and God spoke to me clear in my spirit. He told me I'd have a son one day and he gave me the name Simeon. When I looked up Simeon in the Bible, it meant that God had heard. So I knew that God had heard my prayer. Every single month, I just anticipated and could not wait to possibly be able to take a pregnancy test because I was late or maybe I thought I was having some symptoms. Then the months turned to years. She would bring it up to me, you know, just like, man, what is going on? What's wrong with us? But I was just like, hey, just be patient. I mean, when, when, when he's ready, it's going to happen. You know, until then, let's just carry on with life. I began to get very frustrated. As a woman, the one thing that you feel like God has created you to do, you're not able to do or you're being told that you can't. And you start feeling kind of inadequate. I was always wondering, like, OK, if we didn't have a kid, would she would she feel whole? Would she feel complete? The Marshalls considered in vitro an adoption, but felt neither was God's plan for them. Then in 2009, Celeste had to undergo surgery to remove more polyps. Now approaching 40, her prayers had become desperate. Each year, as I'm fasting and praying, I'm just like, God, if, if I didn't hear from you or if this isn't your will for me, then remove the desire. And if anything, you know, the passion just grew even greater to be a mom and that desire just continued to grow and grow. But as my desire grew, my faith started dwindling because so much time was passing. Even as her faith waned, Celeste found hope in the Bible. One scripture stood out to her. I felt like that's what was happening to me. And it's not that I didn't believe that it would happen, but my faith just started dwindling literally to that size. And as a reminder that that's still enough for God to do the miraculous in your life, I taped it on my bathroom mirror so that every single day I would see it. Then in 2012, Celeste began having intense pains in her side. Her doctor recommended surgery to remove her left ovary and fallopian tube. It would eliminate the pain, but cut her chances of getting pregnant in half. I was completely broken, devastated. It was just like a dagger. But I immediately thought about the promise that God had given me, and I knew that my body had to be whole in order for him to fulfill that promise and for there to be any chance. Terry felt she should have the surgery to prevent future health problems. My whole concern at that point was just her well-being. Like I used to tell her, you know, I don't know what it's like to have a kid, but I know what it's like to have a wife. Celeste, who was now 40, agreed to the surgery. But as the date approached, she grew more anxious. Two days before the procedure, she reached out to God one more time. I was still very emotional about it. And that Wednesday night, December 12th, 2012, I went to church completely broken. And I told God, I said, I cannot and will not leave this sanctuary until I hear from you about what I'm supposed to do. And I just cried the entire service. At the very end of the service, Pastor yelled out, be still. And when he did, my tears literally turned into tears of joy. And I felt like that is what God had given me was to be still regarding that surgery. The next morning, she canceled it. A couple of days after Christmas, she missed her period and decided to take a pregnancy test she had in her desk at work. When I saw the positive, I completely lost my mind in it. <laughs> and I yelled and screamed out to a coworker to um, come into the bathroom. And I mean, that's just so weird, but that's just where my mind was. I was just completely gone at that point. And she saw that test and just screamed with me and we were yelling and hugging each other. Celeste had always dreamed of telling Terry she was pregnant at Christmas time, which was also his birthday. That day, her dream came true. She hollered out she was pregnant. First, first thing I'm about, how did that happen? What happened? How did, how, what happened? I just could not believe it. I couldn't. It was just unbelievable to me, but it was 
my God doing exactly what he said he was going to do. A few months later, an ultrasound showed what Celeste already knew. They were having a boy. When you get to 40, your chances of conceiving are significantly diminished, not zero, but decreased. And in her situation, the fact that she was able to conceive without any of the assistant is likely to really be that miracle. She had a healthy pregnancy, and on August 21st, 2013, Terry Simeon Marshall came into the world. There was just this fullness, not only in my heart, but in my spirit. He's like my little bud now, you know, he's just, you know, generally anything I do, it's like he's pretty much right there in my back pocket. It has just done more to my faith than anything because even from the time that I got the promise and maybe my faith again dwindling down to that the size of a mustard seed, nothing is impossible with God. And Simeon, they're both part of the Christmas story in the Bible. And this is truly our Christmas story. Wow, God hears your prayers. God knows your name. He sees your need. He is listening, and we want to pray with you and for you today. You know, some of the great saints in the Bible have waited, <clears throat> and those people waited, yes. they waited patiently. They never lost faith in the, in the goodness of God, just like Abraham. He waited and waited and waited. Mm -hmm. And, but he was persuaded that God was going to do what he said. All right, uh, here's somebody who's asking for us to pray for a severe concussion. Mm. Somebody is having and uh, needs healing from a stroke. Mm. Somebody wants to restore a uh, broken family. Now here's someone saying, I need complete healing after four heart attacks. Someone else is believing for a full-time job. And here's another one, help for a failing marriage. Family is an important well, All right, Terry and I are going to join hands together, and we're going to believe God for you wherever you are. Jesus. Father, I join hands with my sister in Christ. And you said if two of you would agree on earth as touching anything they could ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And so we come before you, Father, and we ask for miracles for the people who are watching this program all around the world and all throughout the United States, wherever they are. Let the power of God come into their lives right now. May they know a dramatic healing. May they have a dramatic sense of the presence of God. Reveal your plan to them, Lord, at this Christmas season. Thank you, Lord. Terry, what do you have? There's so many of you crying out for your marriages. Marriage is an institution created by God himself. It's his intention for us. God, would you just seal the vows that have been taken by people? Would you interrupt lives? Would you direct? Would you guide? Would you lovingly lead? Would you bring them back to truth and wholeness Thank again? You. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank let you. it be, Lord, let it be. Mm -hmm. And Lord, for all those in this audience who are crying out to you right now, answer their prayer in the name of Jesus. Receive an answer. Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Yeah. Well, Give us a call, by the way. As you have received something from the Lord, please call. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. You want further prayer? Somebody's here on the phone. Just pick up the phone. It's easy to remember. It's an 800 number if you're from out of this area. Uh, it's 707,000. That's easy to, 707,000. It's easy to remember, all right? Well, still ahead, we've got your email. Laura says, recently my stepdad was diagnosed with stage four cancer and I am utterly heartbroken. I'm doing my best to make him as comfortable as I possibly can and to give him the best Christmas ever. I need some help and guidance on how I'm going to get through this. Well, your questions and some honest answers are coming up. But first, meet a family with children who had never received any gifts for Christmas and watch them celebrate the season with presents for the very first time. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The city of Atlanta violated the free speech rights of its fire chief when it fired him for sharing his biblical beliefs. That's what a federal judge ruled. Kevin Cochran had written a book for a men's Bible study. It mentioned the biblical view that homosexuality is a sin. 
He'd given a copy of the book to some employees, so the city fired him. But the judge says the city's speech rules are too broad and violated Cochrane's First Amendment rights. Pro-life activists in Canada are outraged at their government's latest move. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is asking all businesses to sign an agreement supporting abortion and transgender rights. If they don't, they won't be able to receive summer job grants. Opponents say the measure directly discriminates against faith-based employers and will prevent students from working for businesses that do not agree with the Canadian government's liberal views. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. From all of us here in sunny Cape Town, South Africa, at CBN Southern Africa, Christmas presents were always out of the question for a family of eight in Peru. Rosio and her husband barely had enough money to feed their six children, much less give them special gifts at Christmas. That is the way it was until now. Take a look. Christmas in Rocio's home was always a sobering reminder of how tough things were for the family. With six children, Rocio and her husband barely provided enough food for everyone. They never have been able to afford Christmas presents for their children. Rocio runs a small fried chicken business and her husband makes crafts to sell. I didn't have enough money to buy the uniforms or school supplies my children needed. Many times I felt ashamed not being able to meet their needs. Operation Blessing had started a chicken project at the school where Rocio's children attended in Peru. They taught the kids and interested parents how to raise chickens for food and to sell. Rocio quickly volunteered. Operation Blessing noticed her dedication. We also learned about their struggles at home. So we gave Rocio 65 broiler chicks and everything needed to start a poultry business. When they were old enough, Rocio sold them and bought more chicks to raise. The business quickly doubled the family's income. Rocio has finally been able to buy those school uniforms for the kids and they were able to do something else. For the first time, the family could afford to buy Christmas presents. This year we had our first Christmas. In the past, we never got Christmas presents. Raising chickens has opened up new opportunities that once seemed impossible for Rocio and the family. I am grateful. I thank God and Operation Blessing for the great help you are providing. Isn't that marvelous? Isn't it wonderful that you can reach out around the world and help people? And that's the thrill that we have here at CBN, of being able to help people. Uh, you know, it's thrilling. I was reading the 58th chapter of Isaiah again yesterday and today, where it says, this is the joy that we have. You know, you, you reach out and, and, and you would be diligent in feeding the hungry and helping the poor. And we're diligent in doing that. And Operation Blessing has, has given away about, I think about $4 billion worth of stuff so far. Um, and it's so nice to go into an area like that little town in Peru and find somebody like Rosio, who is a wonderful person. She's a hardworking woman, but she just needs a hand. And you know, you give them a hand. Here we gave them some uh, instruction about how to raise chickens. And all of a sudden, they, they've got a thriving poultry business. and It's so, so nice. We can help people. I remember seeing somebody in the Philippines that he said he needed capital. And we said, well, what, what kind of capital are you talking about? He said, I need $20. 20 bucks. $20. You know, you blow that on all kinds of presents at Christmas and decorations and stuff like that. 
twenty dollars, put that man, he would get he would go to the dump and buy uppers, and then he would buy some leather to get the bottoms for them, and he he'd sew them together, and with twenty dollars, he showed me when I was over there some of these wonderful shoes that he'd made, and he's selling those shoes at a pretty good price, and uh, he's self-sustaining now instead of being uh, you know in poverty. We can help people. Okay, here's something by the way, uh, they gave me this, and I'm I want to tell you about it. Uh, you know, the stock market has really boomed. The so-called Trump effect has been awesome. And many stocks are up double, triple, quadruple what they were a year ago. And if you happen to own some of them, especially some of these tech stocks like Amazon, uh, they've gone through the roof. And uh, what do you do? Well, it's possible to give a few shares or 100 shares or a few shares out of your holdings, and you can give them to CBN, and they don't, you don't pay any tax on it, uh, and you get a tax deduction up to the fair market value according to the rules of the IRS. Now, we have somebody that will help in that, and the number is there on your screen. It's 1-800-288-2373. So uh, it, it's really a great thing at the end of the year because the chances are taxes will be lower next year. But this year, a deduction will be worth more to you than it will after the tax cuts go into effect. So, okay. That's something you can do, and we just appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, up next, we've got your email questions. Julie says, Pat, I'm 35, dating a 62-year-old man. We would like to marry, but my parents disapprove. How do I honor my father and mother, but also follow my heart at the same time? Pat gets this <laughs> sticky wicket when we come back. for your questions and some honest answers. Okay. Pat, this first one comes from Laura, who says, Hi, Pat. Recently, my stepdad was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and I am utterly heartbroken. I'm doing my best to stay strong for my mom, brother, and stepdad, and to make him as comfortable as I possibly can, and give him the best Christmas ever. I need some help and guidance on how I'm going to get through this, as even though I appear strong for everyone, I am broken inside. I'm absolutely devastated. Um, I, I don't want to sound trite, but I say the best way out of the wilderness is overcoming praise. You want to praise the Lord. I know it's a difficult situation, and this one that you apparently love a great deal is dying, stage four cancer. Now, God can and often does heal people, so I'm not discounting that. But I would say you begin to praise the Lord. You thank Him in the morning, you thank Him in the noon, and you thank Him at night. You thank Him for what He's going to do for you. You thank Him for being with you. You thank Him for His presence. And you th anything you can think about to thank Him for, you do it. And you praise Him and praise Him and praise Him because He is God and He is all-powerful. Now, that's how you come out of that, that despondency that's upon you. It's, it's natural. But don't dwell on it. Don't dwell on the facts. You look to God, and you will ride on the high places of the earth. All right? Okay, this is Julie, who says, Pat, I'm 35, dating a 62-year-old man. I don't think there's anything biblically wrong with it. We both love each other, are both saved, and would like to marry. However, my parents disapprove and say they'll never accept it. How do I honor my mother and father, but also follow my heart at the same time? Uh, you know, I would hesitate to counsel somebody to go against their parents' wishes, but you're 35, yeah. and you're emancipated, and your parents should not try to keep this joy away from you. Now, they say, you say, well, he's too old. He's probably as old as your parents, and uh, they probably are scared of somebody that age. But, you know, they, you know, 60s is the new 40, and, you know, 80s is the new 60 kind of thing. People are living longer, and they're much more active because we're taking care of the diseases of aging that have caused people to, to, to be infirm. 
uh, they have tooth implants and they have all kinds of procedures and they, they have prosthetic limbs and it goes on and on and on where the diseases that used to take somebody when they were 60 uh, aren't, aren't present anymore because medical science is taking them out and people are living healthier. So a man at 62, I mean, look at the Bible. The guy, you know, Abraham was 100 years old when he started. He had a child. His wife was 90. So age isn't the big factor it used to be. And I, I think you and the, your fiancé or whatever you call him ought to go ahead and just tell your parents, look, I love you and I honor you, but I, I can't stop that. I'm, I'm going to get married. I love him. And, and our happiness is what we're laying on the line. Please accept it. All right. This is a viewer who says, Jesus said, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you in John 5, 14, after he healed the man at the pool. So my question is, will sin, in my case, sexual sin, stop or block my healing from God? Will it counteract God's promises of blessing in my life? I'm a young and single man, and I'm really struggling in these areas. You know, we keep getting that question. I might be the same guy. I don't know. It's, it's, it sounds like the same thing over and over again. The Bible says it's better to marry than to burn with lust. And you apparently are given over to this stuff, and it's driving you crazy. And you, you, you know it's sin, and you know it's wrong. And why do you ask me questions about will it keep you out? Yes, it will. If, if you're doing this on a continuous basis, it can block your interest to heaven. So, I mean, either get used to the fact that you're a eunuch made, you know, in the service of God and you're going to be celibate, or else get married. But don't watch porn. Don't look at dirty pictures uh, on in the magazines. Don't read salacious li literature. And read the Bible and get with it. All right? All right. Well said, that, yes. That's the way it's got to be. But, I mean, don't Stop. ask me to give you a pass on something you know you're doing wrong. You know, the Bible says if, if, if our heart condemns us, then, you know, does not condemn us, then we have confidence with God that we'll get what we ask of Him. But if our con heart condemns us, God's greater than our heart, and He knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. So you obviously have a guilty conscience. So. Clean, that, clean up your act, and the Lord will help you. He really will. He, he'll do everything He can to bring you into conformity with His will. But that's what the Bible says. Better to marry than to burn with lust. Thank you, the Apostle Paul. We leave you today with a classic Christmas carol from the uh, acapella group, Home Free. <laughs> 